Welcome. Welcome to the Durham County Library. We're always so pleased when you choose to spend your Sunday afternoon, and especially a glorious Sunday afternoon like this with us. I'm Joanne Abel, the Humanities Programming Coordinator, and those of you that have been here before know we give a brief commercial for some upcoming events, and also for the Durham Library Foundation that makes this um, program and all the Humanities program possible. We're in the middle of a campaign. We hope everybody will earn their stripes by becoming a member of the, library, the Durham Library Foundation. We have uh, two really good programs I want to tell you about tomorrow here. We're having, as part of our Bullish on Durham series, we're having the architect of the Durham Performing Arts Center come and talk about the new renovations and additions, including 15 women's bathrooms, yay, um, and a hotel. I thought that was a very funny thing to be listed. But anyway, um, that's going to be a fun, that's at 7 o'clock here. And then next Sunday, we have a very, very special program, too. We have Anita Woolley who presented Mama Jugs, her one-woman play, last October. She's bringing her new play, The Men and Me. It has music, it has poetry. She's an amazing artist. She won the, one of the Indie Awards. That will be next Sunday here at 3. And now I would like to introduce Lynn Richardson, the North Carolina Library. Great to see everybody here today. I want, to, want to say welcome to you also. Um, my very brief commercial is about the North Carolina collection at the Durham County Library. Um, the main purpose of the North Carolina collection is to preserve and make available the historical record of Durham County. Um, as you would expect, it contains books. We are a library. But uh, what you may not know is we have several thousand photographs of Durham old maps, uh, materials to use to do your uh, family history if you're a gene you know, genealogy buff, uh, old newspapers where you can find all kinds of great local history and uh, family research materials, and a lot more. So if you're interested in local history or genealogy and haven't visited the North Carolina collection, we're up on the third floor and I hope, uh, I hope you will. Um, and what makes the collection really unique is all the materials that people uh, who have ties to the Durham community donate. Uh, the photographs, most of them have been donated. Uh, old high school yearbooks, that kind of thing. So if you have Durham materials that you'd like to see preserved that are uh, you know, relevant to our history and culture, please give me a call. I'd love to talk to you about, um, about donating them to the library. Um, now I want to introduce our uh, panel moderator and uh, speaker today, Brian McDonald. Brian has taught history at Jordan High School since 2001. He holds a bachelor's degree from Elon University and a master's degree in African American history from North Carolina Central University. Brian was named the first fellow at the Center for Poverty, Work, and Opportunity at UNC and in 2009 was named Teacher of the Year at Jordan High School. He also serves as an adjunct learning fellow in the program of education at Duke University. Not the end, but the beginning is his first book. Um, and I'm, speaking of the book, um, the copies are not printed. We were hoping to have them today. They're supposed to be done in a couple weeks. You can pre-order in the back. There are several copies for you to take a look at, and Brian is kind man that he is is going to send them out uh, free of charge, no shipping. So I uh, hope you'll take a look after the program and uh, sign up for one. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me clarify, free shipping, not free of charge. <laughs> Lynn said free of charge like I, I, my son has to eat. So... <laughs> Free shipping. Didn't mean. Yes. No, I'm thrilled to be here, and there are a couple people that I have to thank before I talk a little bit about the uh, process. First of all, if you don't know Joanne Abel and Lynn Richardson at the library, and I know many of you do, but if you don't, uh, they are fantastic people. Uh, Lynn Richardson was instrumental in this book even happening, uh, showing me things in the North Carolina collection I didn't even know existed. So this would have been impossible. Uh, certainly without her, and Joanne has made today possible as well. Uh, only a couple more thank yous, I promise. Uh, I'm thrilled, and this will talk a little bit about uh, the process of the book as well, but I'm thrilled to see uh, friends and family and former students. Someone walked in this morning or this afternoon and said, do you remember me? I was in your first class ever 
when you were a first year teacher at Jordan. And I did remember, and I felt old, and I <laughs> did not appreciate that. Uh, my wife is here, and she's in the back, so please uh, say hello to her on your way out. Uh, she also is uh, the reason that today is happening. So I'm grateful to everyone, and I will introduce our panel uh, momentarily. When I was a graduate student at North Carolina Central University, uh, I had two professors who are actually here today, and I'm flattered that they are, Jerry Gershenhorn and Freddie Parker. And both of them on two different occasions uh, suggested that I do my master's thesis on the history of Jordan High School, where I was a teacher and continue to be a teacher. I just started my 13th year there. And my first answer was, no, absolutely not. That's a terrible idea. Uh, and both of them, two separate occasions, offered that as a suggestion. My, I had other ideas. I had other plans um, and quickly dismissed uh, their idea. Uh, I mentioned their idea to a couple people, a couple people on stage. Uh, and they immediately began recounting stories of, let me tell you about this event. Let me tell you about this event. Did you know that there was a sit-in at Jordan? Did you know that there was a protest at Jordan? Have you heard about? And every story that I heard uh, made me regret that I said, no, absolutely not. I won't do that as my thesis. Uh, and had to go back to both Dr. Parker and Dr. Gershenhorn and say, I changed my mind. That's actually a very good idea, and I'm going to take your advice. So without the two of them and their encouragement and their efforts, uh, today this book, this event, uh, would be impossible. Uh, since my first reaction to was to run into the wind screaming at the idea uh, because I couldn't possibly think about teaching every day at the building and then researching every night about the stories that took place there. Uh, but I'm glad that I did, uh, and I'm honored that you're here uh, today. What some folks don't know is that Jordan High School opened as the first desegregated school in Durham County. Now, this is less impressive when you find out that the schools in Durham County were Jordan High School, Northern High School, and Southern High School. I say that because Durham City Schools, as many of you know, was a separate school system. Durham High School, integrated in 1957, uh, and Hillside High School, the predominant schools in Durham City. Uh, so when we opened, we're one of only three schools, three white schools, in Durham County. Uh, and so a number of students uh, attend Jordan. I say we're the first desegregated. Let's remind ourselves of what that means. When Jordan opens in the fall of 63, there are 500 students at the school. Two of them are black uh, when we first opened in 63. As the years progress, other black students begin to attend Jordan, though it is 1969 that is the turning point for Jordan, for Durham Public Schools, or for Durham County and Durham City Schools as a result of a Supreme Court case, Alexander v. Holmes County Board of Education. It is this Supreme Court case that says all school systems must be desegregated, not the Brown v. Board of Education integrate schools when you get a chance to, but this must happen or you will lose funding and there will be consequences for not following the court case that happened 15 years earlier. It was, as many of you know, a slow process in both Durham City and Durham County. Some of you here today went through that process, and I, as a teacher in 2013, am eternally grateful for it. 1969, the black student population at Jordan High School is 3%. The next year, as a result of that court case, and the final integration plans, the next year, the black student population at Jordan High School is 18%. In one school year, from 3% to 18%. Now, the race conflict and tensions and other issues that you hear around the country that happened in the 1950s and the 1960s did not happen at Jordan High School. They did happen at Jordan High School in the early 1970s. As a result of that ruling and as a result of the significant shift in population of students, some of which you'll hear from today. I want to offer uh, a brief reading from the book that goes back to 1963 and speaks to the uh, time period where the first two students to desegregate our schools, David Curtis Jones and Arthur McCollum, I want to talk a little bit about and we'll read from uh, the reason they came and a couple of the experiences that they had when they first arrived at our school. While white students dealt with class tensions 
For the few black students who attended Jordan in the mid-60s, race was clearly the major factor in the difficulties they faced at the school. Arthur McCullum, one of the first two black students to attend, was one of the top academic students at Merrick Moore High School. His guidance counselor strongly encouraged him to attend Jordan for its strong academic rigor, believing, uh, believing it was there that he would get the best education. David Curtis Jones decided to attend Jordan for two reasons. It was closer to his home and he wanted to play football. He had made an agreement with four of his friends to play football for the school, but when he showed up to the first practice over the summer, he realized that they had chickened out. Still, it was his choice, and after making arrangements with Coach Popson, he joined the team. After their arrival, McCollum and David Jones experienced substantial difficulties as the only two black students and responded differently to deal with those tensions. For example, more than anything, McCollum remembered a tough curriculum that was unforgiving if you didn't do well. These classes were much more demanding than they were at Merrick Moore, and McCollum, by his own account, was, quote, slow to adjust to a new environment. It was like going to a private school, a whole different set of values. Most of the stu students were interested in going to college. When it came to issues of race, the conflicts were limited because he, quote, played a safe hand as he avoided many whites at first. Still, as he remembered, he was discriminated against because he was black. He was told by some students to stay away from the white girls. And by avoiding his classmates to limit the possibilities of being treated badly, he was isolated. Still, he experienced racist attitudes. As McCollum remembered, I did feel as if some of the white students looked down upon me because of my race. It did bother me some. It's a matter of people looking down on you, seeing you as inferior and not as good as they are, simply because I was black. Though Jones went to school for football, he too faced the challenge of being different. As he later recalled, I didn't realize that when I go there, white kids, they just didn't talk to you. I came to recognize that the very first day of practice. Essentially, it was a you do your thing and I'll do my thing kind of attitude. This interaction spilled over to the, into the halls as well. While Jones did not really have any white friends, he didn't seem to have any enemies either. He mostly kept to himself and tried to balance academics with athletics. The latter became a focal point for David in that first year. Though his mother, Christine Jones, remembers that the other players were pretty rough with him, Coach Popson believed that none of them really gave him a hard time, and we just accepted him. Other white players on the team also believed that the team camaraderie existed and that athletics superseded any differences between members on the team. Clearly, there was a difference in the black and white perception of the football team's race relations. Whatever the case, the turning point in Jones's relationship with the team seems to have come at an away football game in Henderson. As Coach Thompson recalled, the people that worked there told me that they were going to be hostile because of a black player. As a result of this forewarning, he asked Jones's parents not to attend the game for their own safety and protection. Once they arrived, Jones was met with a number of racial slurs and shouting from the crowd before the game had even started. Popson played Jones early in the game and then, for his own protection, took him out and had him wear his helmet on the sidelines. Once the game was over, white players surrounded Jones and rushed him back to the bus. Spectators tried to follow Jones and the other Jordan players, but the police escort prevented any further action. As Coach Popson reflected, if we had reacted to it, it would have been explosive. Each and every one of us think, I think, we kept our cool and tried to get out of there as quick as possible. As a matter of fact, I don't think we took showers. The police were very helpful. But because they were throwing things at the bus, Popson told the players to put their duffel bags against the windows to avoid broken glass. The Jordan players made it back to the school without any further incident. For Jones, that game changed his feelings about his teammates. Any hostilities that existed among the players because of race seemed to have disappeared as the white players openly protected their black teammate. As far as David was concerned, I felt closer to the team at that game than any other game we played. By contrast, his mother experienced a different revelation. As she recalled, it was a miserable evening for me. I couldn't wait for David to get home. I heard stories like this and others about the first few years. How could you not write your thesis about this very topic? Now, how could you not explore these, ca these stories and these issues and these events and talk to the people that lived through it 
and that made this change possible in the very first place. I will tell you that when I first heard, uh, and this shows uh, me as a naive historian or maybe a question, uh, questioning historian, I first heard this story about the football game from some of the white players on the team. And my first reaction was, hmm, okay, I don't know that I fully believe their side of the story, given the time period, given the context, given the other versions of other stories I had heard at the time. Let me explore this further. Let me explore this story. Let me explore Jordan's history further. I was able to interview both David Curtis Jones and Arthur McCollum, the first two, school, uh, first two black students to desegregate our school. Uh, and not only did David confirm this story, he uh, went beyond the pride of the white athletes at the time uh, and was ecstatic with his teammates and grateful uh, every day of that event that they surrounded him to get him back to the bus. Now, what I'm most excited about uh, with this book, and I say this in all seriousness, is that I have an opportunity to do today's event uh, with this panel that sits before you. And I say this because I'll do a number of events this fall semester, uh, but most of them as uh, book readings go is a reading and a discussion. And it's more focused on me, which I know my wife says I appreciate. <laughs> but today's event is special, and I'll tell you why. Uh, today's event is special because uh, Lynn asked me, to, can you put a panel together of people for today's event? And my first reaction was, absolutely. I had about uh, four or five people in mind, uh, and they're here today uh, with us. And I want to take a minute uh, and introduce uh, the panel. Maurice Hayes, to my immediate left, graduated uh, from Jordan High School in 1976, beginning there in 1973. He's a longtime police officer. If he looks familiar to you, I hope it is for the right reasons. <laughs> if it's not, keep that to yourself. I first met Maurice uh, when he was a police officer, uh, in a good way, not in a bad way. <sighs> uh, I first met Maurice when he was a police officer, and he was um, assigned, I guess, to Jordan High School. Uh, and so I saw him just about every day, uh, and our relationship began then, I think, 10 years ago. Uh, and he was nice enough to sit and discuss uh, the book with me. He's unique to this panel, being there from 1973 to 1976, because he lived in the aftermath of what I argue was the time period of uh, the most intense race relations in our building. He was there when the first black assistant principal arrived. He was there when the sit-in took place. Uh, and so he has a unique perspective. Uh, today he is the founder and CEO of Carolina Security Agency, uh, and so I am thrilled that he is here. To his left is Stephen Berenger. Stephen Berenger graduated uh, a little bit later from Jordan High School in 1981. Uh, Stephen is involved with a variety of family-owned businesses around Durham. Uh, the perspective he brings, and I am grateful for it, uh, is the, he is the president of our alumni association at our school. Uh, I can assure you that this book is impossible uh, or would have been impossible without his support uh, over the last, let's say, two years. It was really a six-year process, but let's say two years. Uh, and he has worked in that role with alumni classes from the very beginning to the present day uh, and shares uh, a passion for the school like no other person I have ever met before. To his left is Professor Belinda Jones. Belinda Jones graduated, if she will allow me to, admit this, in 1967. Professor Jones uh, has spent 30 plus years as a health educator, a college instructor, a program director, a volunteer trainer. She is currently a professor at North Carolina Central University. She is the mother of two Jordan graduates. She is the grandmother of one Jordan graduate uh, and two current uh, students at Jordan as well. Uh, professor Jones was one of the first interviews I did for the book. She didn't know me from anybody. Didn't know me from anybody. Spoke to me on the phone, invited me into her home. We sat in, uh, on the couch in her living room for two hours. Uh, had lemonade. It was one of the nicest experiences that I had. Uh, and my reaction was, if every interview is like this, then this will be the easiest thing to write that I've ever written. 
I assure you, every interview was not that easy. <laughs> to Belinda's left is Janet Turin. Janet Turin also graduated from Jordan High School in 1967. She taught elementary school for 29 years. She founded the Jordan High School Alumni Association. Uh, and she, she has also had two children go through Jordan High School. And she continues to be involved uh, with our school. If you've ever been to an athletic event at Jordan High School, then you've seen Janet Turin because to this very day, she volunteers her time and her energy and her effort, uh, even though uh, her children have since long gone uh, all the time at Jordan. I could not be more excited uh, that they are here with us today, uh, and it brings me great pleasure to facilitate a panel discussion with these four panels. Please give them a round of a hand. <laughs> I need to start with uh, Belinda and Janet, and I apologize to the gentleman to my left, but I need to start with Belinda and with Janet for this reason. They were there uh, from the very beginning. Janet Turn was a student at Jordan the day it opened, uh, and Belinda Jones came the very next year to our school. Uh, and our panel today focuses on the integration of Jordan, and they lived it each and every day that they were a student there. Uh, and so, Belinda, Janet, I'd like to start with you all to, to share with us a little bit about how you got to Jordan, perhaps how you got to Durham, but then your thoughts on being a student in that school. Well, I have, can you hear me without using the microphones? No. <laughs> um, I moved to Durham in 1964. So I wasn't there when it first opened, but I came in February of 64, and because my parents moved to Durham, so I moved with them. I was in the ninth grade, and um, I came from a school, I lived in West Virginia, and I came from a school that was integrated already. So when I came to Jordan, nothing was, nothing was out of the ordinary, that's just how, how it was. Um, I guess Belinda didn't come until the next year. What I remember mostly about Jordan and those years was not so much of the race issue, but the socioeconomic issue. It, I guess Jordan brought together kids from um, the Hope Valley area and the Lowe's Grove area. And that seemed to be the, bi the biggest issue, the Lowe's Grove and the, o the Hope Valley kids really didn't interact. Now, from my perspective, all I wanted to do was fit in. And I guess as teenagers, we sort of uh, have tunnel vision. How, what are we going to do so nobody talks about us, so everybody likes us? And that's how I think I, I spent my four years at Jordan, figuring out how I was going to be well-liked and... Um, I asked Belinda when she came in, because we just had our 40th, was it our 40th or 45th? 45th. <laughs> our 45th high school reunion, and last year, 46. Um, was I ever mean? Did I ever do anything mean? And she assured me that I didn't, which made me feel very good. But the, on the other hand, I'm not sure I ever did anything nice either. And that sort of makes me feel bad too. Now, I wish I was the kind of person then that I am now. Um, and I guess in retrospect, maybe we all do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I first want to say, uh, in Brian's uh, reference to David Jones, <laughs> he was my ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I have to say something. I did know that, and I was going to let it. And I thought Belinda was, well, I, Belinda and I sort of reconnected years later in Chapel Hill, and I thought she was the luckiest person in the world because her name was Jones, and she married a Jones, and she didn't have to change a thing. <laughs> well, that's not always a great thing, but... Uh, uh, David and I grew up together in the same neighborhood, so the events that Brian talked about, I, I knew about also firsthand. Um, I, so I, I was brought up in Orange County, I mean, Durham County. I uh, went to Pearsontown Elementary School. 
uh, way before it was um, integrated. Um, and my parents thought that, you know, that they were building this new, brand new high school, and it was close, it's just about a five minute drive uh, from our home. And um, they said, you know, well, it's, it's going to be, you know, majority white school. And they said it was going to be a better school and that I would get a better education. And so that was their thoughts about it. And so they wanted uh, me to go. They wanted all of us to go. And as a matter of fact, I have five sisters and a brother, and all seven of us uh, graduated from Jordan High School. Um, and what was your other question, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> about some of those first uh, memories that you have of the school. Yeah, you know, I got about three or four months before I reach official senior citizen age. But, um, so I've been having a lot of senior moments. Um, but it was, it was sort of unpleasant, really, to be quite honest. Um, we were sort of and then when I went in 64, as Janet said, um, I think there were seven black students by then. And there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of, um, you know, here we are in high school when we thought we would have the most fun in our developing years. And we were supposed to go to Merrick Moore High School, which was like 25 to 30 miles from our house. And that's where all the black kids in our, in our neighborhood went to. And, and here we were, we felt socially isolated in so many ways. Uh, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't have friends, we clung to each other. Uh, we went to the cafeteria, nobody would sit with us. Uh, in most classes, and I'm not saying, I'm just giving the facts, okay? Um, when in the classrooms, there was generally one, uh, I was the only one in the classroom. But I will say, that for the most part, all of my teachers were pretty fair uh, in their treatment towards me, and I didn't have a lot of difficulty. I, I was a, a, a primarily A student when I came from Pearson Town, from first to the ninth grade at Pearson Town. I was still an A, B student at Jordan, primarily A student at Jordan. And, um, uh, so the academics didn't didn't bother me so much, but the whole social thing of being called the N word, uh, being isolated, uh, you know, being you know talked down to or looked at as less than. But the thing that I think kept me going was that my parents that my parents always said, you are just as good as anybody. And so that you need to keep your head up, you need to keep doing your best. And you, you know, you can't let what other folks say about you or do to you uh, keep you from doing your best. And so um, it, it was a, a very difficult. And as the years wore on, um, and I was there from, 10th grade through 12th grade, um, it, it got better and better each year. And, you know, some folks began to be more friendly. And, um, but there still was a lot of ostracism. And I had one incident where I had a cousin who uh, was a year younger than me. He was, and he came from, from New Jersey, from Trenton, New Jersey, to live with my grandmother. And then he went and went to Jordan. And he was just like, he was, because you know, the schools in the North were integrated much, much sooner. And he was just like, he just couldn't believe the way things were going on. And so we had to ride the bus, right? Um, so in order to make us sit in the back of the bus, the students would all sit on the end of the seats so that we couldn't sit down. And my cousin, <laughs> He, he wasn't having it. So he pushed somebody over on the front seat. And the bus driver slammed on brakes. He was a student. And she uh, threatened to put him off. He said, I'm not getting off. 
And when he, they got back to school, he reported, she reported him to the principal. And he was suspended from school for two weeks uh, and could not ride the bus. So I'll just stop right there and That's begin to yes, great. some other things. Now, a, a <clears throat> quick fact about Belinda that I hope she doesn't mind me sharing. Jordan used to do um, in their yearbook and as part of their end of the year celebrations, the top 10 most outstanding seniors. Still today, we do the most outstanding senior and the faculty votes um, still today in 2013. Uh, but back then they used to highlight the 10 most outstanding seniors. Uh, and in 1967, uh, Belinda was one of the 10 most outstanding seniors voted on by the staff at the time. Uh, and her picture appeared in the yearbook uh, what she may not know is that picture also appears in my book. So I hope that she's okay with that. <laughs> I probably should have asked her if that was okay first. But that picture it's, appears uh, in the book as well. It's okay. It's a good thing. <laughs> uh, okay. Belinda, one quick follow-up. Okay. When, when we sat down uh, three, four years ago now, yeah. four years ago now. About 22 years uh, yeah. You, you made a comment to me that, that stood out so much. Uh, can I share this? Sure. Are you sure? Sure. I asked uh, Belinda about some of the experiences and how she got to Jordan and said, well, my parents uh, insisted that I go and she, for the reasons she explained. And I said, well, why would they do that? Um, and she talked a little bit about what she's already stated. Um, and then out of nowhere, or what felt like out of nowhere for me in one of my first interviews, uh, she made the comment that, her father didn't much like white people, didn't much like white people at all. And my immediate follow-up was, then why on earth would you attend Jordan where it is mostly white people? Uh, and the statement she made, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't her father's original uh, statement, but the statement her father made was because the white man's ice is colder. Mm -hmm. And if you could just explain that for a, a second. It, it stayed with me for years. And, and still today, I think there's that still prevailing thought. For instance, there are a lot of people, even African-American people, who will go to a white doctor or dentist because they think they're better, that they're more qualified. When in fact, because I have worked for a doctor, a black doctor, I know that they had to do even more to be qualified. And so it was felt that anything that was white, whether it was a school, whether it was a doctor's office, a shop, or whatever, it was better that the white man's ice was colder. Thanks, Wanda. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, uh, I know, is a graduate of 1981. Uh, Stephen wrote the foreword to the book, which I'm grateful for every day, uh, and told a story in that foreword that I hope he'll share now about um, his situation in 1969. First off, I was never an A student <laughs> at any time. I'm going to clarify that. Um, yeah, 1969, I had two older brothers, uh, four and five years older than I am. They were at Pearson Town after having left Hope Valley Elementary when I was a first grader, when um, I guess integration hit. And two weeks into my first grade year at uh, Hope Valley Elementary, we were pulled out by, I went with 13 other friends to our family's farm up in northern Durham County for a one-year private school funded by our parents in a one-room farmhouse. Of course, our recesses were, you know, we had a swimming pool, and I mean, it, it was insane. So I remember when Brian started this process, and you know, you start talking to people, and you start, and I'm reading his first drafts, I went to my mom, and I said, why did y'all do that? And she goes, I don't know, we were wrong. Which took her a long time to realize that, but there was a lot of fear. She didn't have any fear for my older brothers, but there was something about you know, first grade and something new that you know, we got pulled out of Hobelli Elementary because there was no room at Durham Academy where we all subsequently ended up the following year. So, not, not the proudest moment, but I mean, that's what happened. And I have a unique perspective working with graduating classes from 65 forward, and both Janet and Belinda are right. Um, prior to integration, a lot of the issues we see when crafting something as simple as reunion all are fraught with uh, social and issues related to class. Um, 
I won't mention classes by name, but there's one class that will not do anything because they still harbor so much resentment after 45, 50 years that they can't even get together to decide if they want barbecue or hot dogs. Um, we do find, but, but problematically, also going forward, there are classes in the 90s where they won't get together because one race dominates the, the hierarchy of the planning structure and the other half just doesn't want to put up with it. So while we've made a lot of progress in a lot of ways, some of that stuff is still here. Um, you know, the, the whole concept of, you know, white man's ice is colder. I mean, I, I liken that to something that most white people don't even wear, the, the concept of white privilege, where, you know, you go through, I would never act that way. Janet said, I never did anything mean. Well, and you, you, you made the key point, you may not have done anything nice. And that's where the whole concept of, you know, my friends would never accuse me of being a racist because you've not done anything overtly, but that's because you're living in, in this, with this view of everything that everything's great because you haven't had to have the same issues. I know by the time we got there in the 80s at Jordan, I moved out to uh, Durham Academy after eighth grade, got to Githens as a ninth grader, then Jordan. You know, our issues were not so much race related as they were back to social and class. And you know, it's heartbreaking reading some of the stuff in Brian's book about our era. You know, and I, I, you know, I'm not kidding, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you, I grew up in Ho Valley, very privileged life. And it's just heartbreaking to read what some of my good friends would say about what a struggle it was for them to just buy shoes to keep up with, you know, the kids from Ho Valley. I and mean, that just blows me away. Anything else? No, not yet. <laughs> well, yeah, you're up, you're up. Uh, Maurice uh, came to Jordan a couple years uh, after some of this early integration occurred at our school, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, has uh, certainly some, we were talking when he first arrived about how he uh, arrived in Durham and ended up on the path to Jordan. Uh, so I'd love to hear that and then some of your experiences given the sort of unique events that took place during your time there as a student. Hello. How are you? You know, it's really interesting, the path that uh, I took to get to Jordan High School. Um, my mom and dad, like Belinda's, told me that I was not going to go to Hillside High School. There was no choice. To this day, I thank both of them. And the reason for it is that they wanted me to be as diverse as the society that we have today. Now, both my parents went to Hillside. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with Hillside High. I'm just saying they wanted something different for their son. Followed by me was a brother and then a sister. Every last one of them went to Jordan High School. Jordan High School was all I knew because of my experience. So in return, I bought a house in Jordan's district so my daughter could go. That worked out great, by the way. I um, didn't have the experiences as uh, Belinda and Janet did. Uh, you guys are actually my hero. You're my heroes. You truly are. A uh, great deal of respect for what they went through, and they actually paved the way for my class in 73. When I walked into Jordan High School, I was afraid. I'm not going to lie to you. But I trusted in my parents that they had done the right thing for me. When I got to Jordan, I did not have the issues that, that Janet and Belinda had. The teachers were very great. But those ways were paid by people like Frank Hill, Lonnie Dowdy. These were class leaders, Emily Biggs, Shirley Thompson. If you couple that with the teachers that were there that wanted to take the challenge to make integration work, John Popson, Larry Parrish, Andy Rogers, I mean, if you think about all these, and then you had Mr. Seals, who was the principal. This man was thrusted into a bad situation, and he accepted it. So what did he do? He went out and he got Charles Guest. A lot of people may not know Charles Guess's history. 
But Charles Guest was actually a teacher at Pearson Town yeah. Elementary when I came through. Thank you. A great deal of respect for the man. A great deal of respect. So these are the leaders that you had. And then you had the teachers buy in, both black and white. I too didn't have a bad experience uh, with my teachers. And then you had your student leaders. Frank Hill and Ronnie Dowdy were actually, how many have seen the, the movie uh, Remember the Titans? I, I figure everybody's seen that. That's what you had. That's exactly what you had. You had Ronnie Dowdy from one side of town, Frank Hill from the other side of town. This is where it started. This is why things were squelched. Because we all own a football field. There was never a racial incident when I played football in 1973. Not one. Not even the N-word. If it happened, I didn't hear it. Miss Parker has a son that I went to school with, one of my best friends. Um, and to the day we refer to each other as uh, Big T and Little T. Because that's what our friends used to call us. I mean, you heard the term Uncle Tom. So when he calls me, he says, hey, Big T, how you doing? I said, what's up, Little T? We've actually made a joke out of it in the 70s, in, in 73, up to 76. Because of the way things went earlier and the people who paved the way for us. We're talking about Hope Valley. I've been in houses in Hope Valley. I've been in your house, Stephen. <laughs> Stephen wasn't there, but. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but his brother Rusty was, or Russell was. And Russell came out of our class. Um, so the people before me actually paved the way. And it wasn't just the administration and the faculty. But you had to have someone there to be the leader at Jordan High School to kind of hold this thing together, the progress that we made. And that's what happened with us. So it actually ended up being a great experience for me. It really did. And I want to add on to that. You know, Frank Hill was my next door neighbor growing up. And on the Jordan High School alumni website page is an article he wrote that I asked him to write about that football season with Ronnie Dowdy. And it's called Remember the Titrations, which is some you know, that's a Greek reference. But it's a, it's a fascinating article, and he talks about, and, and that, you know, Jordan's a school after all, and you, you can't denigrate the academics, but athletics had a lot to do with keeping things on even keel, because let me tell you what, I was 12 or 13 when Maurice took the field, and there were a lot of white kids in Hope Valley running around with 22s painted on their T-shirts. Their and they, I mean, they may not look, much younger than him, but I'm old enough that you know, he was my hero on the football field for a long time. And you know, Frank was a great guy, Morehead Scholar, and also coming out of that class was Bill Marable, great athlete, African American, and he left Durham. He's been at MIT ever since. He's one of the most esteemed astrophysicists in the world. I mean, the, the definition of a rocket scientist. I mean, it was an extraordinary time because great academics were going on, but it was paired with athletics that you know kept things nice, as they could be. In a lot of the research I, I did for the book, one of the themes that I saw was athletics. It was athletics that kept uh, any unity that happened, happened because of athletics. Over time and into the 70s, it became athletics and fine arts and the music program uh, and the arts department. Uh, a lot of credit is given to athletics, but Back to two things Maurice said, and, and a general question for the entire panel. What about those that weren't athletes? Certainly it was on the field. David Curtis Jones admitted that the team was his protection. Maurice talks about not a single racial incident on the football field. But what about what was life like if you were not an athlete in the day-to-day -day experiences that you had? And I'm glad that Maurice... Um, told the big T, little T story, I heard that earlier. Um, but Charles Guess, who he mentioned, was the first African-American administrator. Brought to campus in 1974, frequently called 
by the black students and Uncle Tom. He was, uh, with the research I did, met with mixed response from the black students that were, stu were there at the time. Uh, and those that did not appreciate him being there uh, referenced him that way. And so I guess two questions for the panel. Beyond athletics, what was the day-to-day -day like? And um, sort of the, any, any additional comments on Charles Guess, I would appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, well, I knew Mr. Guess, as um, Maurice said, from Pearson Town School. He was a, a teacher there. And I, uh, and I think uh, before he left there, I think he was principal at, at Pearson Town. But uh, so I don't know anything about his um, his his um, uh, administration uh, uh, administrative position at Jordan. But um, uh, I will say that day to day, uh, you ask what you know if you weren't about involved in sports, um, uh, there was not a lot what, for for African American students uh, uh, really. Um, and that was one of the things that when I thought about it in um, later years, I said, you know, it crippled me socially. And that, um, you know, had I gone to Mary Moore, I might have been in the course, I might have been in uh, this, that, and the other, but I didn't feel that same freedom at Jordan. And um, also, like a lot of, sometimes in the classrooms, students would move their chairs away from you. But there was a defining e event. Uh, when I was in 11th grade, I believe it was, we had a uh, talent show. Um, it was somewhere near the end of the school year, I believe it was. And there were several black students that got together and we came up with a dance routine, some kind of line dance routine, you know, a real hip routine, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and we, we were, I think, the last uh, act on the talent show. And everybody was just screaming and up on their feet and really cheering us on because, I mean, I don't even remember the song we did it to or anything of that nature. But they put our picture in the paper the next week. But one of the things, Mr. Smith, John T. Smith, was the principal when I was there. Now, Mr. Smith, um, he, strict. Yeah, he was very strict. But while I was, yeah, but fair. This was, I was trying to figure out how to characterize him. He was very strict. I don't think he was too keen on uh, integration, but he would not allow a lot of stuff to go on. He would just not allow it to go on. And um, but he got up that night. Uh, after the um, talent show, he says, this talent show has been fantastic. It's been an awesome cake. He said, but this group has been the icing on the cake. And everybody just went up, just screamed and carried on. And that night was sort of a breaking point because a lot of kids, now this was like 65, 66. A lot of the, of the white kids that lived in Hope Valley invited us to their homes, you know, for like the school after, it was kind of like an after party. And we were like, what? <laughs> and uh, we, we did go to a couple of folks' home. And um, so it was like a defining point. And it kind of broke the ice some. And people started coming up to us, talking to us more after that. Well, and everyone needs to buy this book because there's a story that's the opposite of that that happens. I love that he started with that, though. You're right. I mean, the, the, book, the, the book is... just follow me around, and that would be great. I'm telling you, it, it is a really fantastic story. You will not believe the things you read. And, and like she's telling is one of the highlights. There was another where some African-American group wanted to do something on stage, and they were prevented from doing so. And that, that was the impetus of, like, one of the first sit-ins at the school. So, I mean, you know, it, it goes back both ways. Um, I want to relay something about the, the academics for African-American kids. When I was a senior, there was a, uh, a boy in the 11th grade, and he looked exactly like Steve Urkel. Anyone know who that is? It's like the absolute definition of a bookworm. And, you know, despite being 
really, really nice, and, and mo mildly athletic. He was off the charts smart, but he was hounded by his fellow black classmates for acting white. You know, why are you doing that? And he, he didn't even make it through his junior year before he fortunately got a scholarship to go to one of the nice elite boarding schools in the Northeast, but I always thought, hey, this is just terrible. And I think that a lot of that still happens today. It's probably even more prevalent today. Is it not? Do you not find that? Well, I'm not sure where, where Brian's going to lead the rest of the discussion, but I will say this, that everybody thought that, well, there was a lot, of course, dissension about uh, integration. A lot of black folks, I'll say black folks, because that was the term at that time, Negroes and black folks okay, at that time, thought it was the best thing for us to have integration, okay? Because they thought that it would be better opportunity. And I remember in elementary school at Pearson Town, when we used to get our textbook, we said, why are there people's names already written in our textbooks? Then we figured out that we got the used books from the white schools. And then we had this used school buses from the white schools that were breaking down all the time. I tell my students now at North Carolina Central, I would have never imagined that a major mall would be on Fayetteville Road because our school bus used to come up that road. It was a dirt road. And I remember our bus breaking down many times. So anyways, we got a lot of the stuff that was passed down uh, from the white schools, but a lot of people, so a lot of people thought, if the schools were integrated, then we would have equal education. Here's what a lot of people didn't think about, black or white, what the social, the psychosocial and cultural implications were of that whole dynamic. And for that reason, nobody put anything into place that would address those dynamics. And that's why you had some, because I made A's and stuff all the time, and you know, and well, I was ostracizing my own family for that, but anyway. <laughs> There were a lot of students that, you know, because, and even when I, I, I'll say this, when I graduated from Jordan High School, I was a semi-finalist in the National Merit Exam. And therefore, I got invitations from colleges all over the United States. But I said, I am not going to a predominantly white college. I am not. I've had enough. I'm just going to say it. I've had enough of white people right now. <laughs> And I said, I'm going somewhere where my people are. And I only applied to two schools. That was North Carolina, it was North Carolina College at that time, and North Carolina A&T. And I was accepted at both, and I went to North Carolina College. Because that social isolation was really blaring. It was a blaring kind of thing that, you know, that nobody took into account. And here's the other thing about it. The cultural piece is that, like you talked about white privilege, and the whole thing about white privilege, and, and this woman, Peggy, Peggy McIntosh, and you can look it up on, online, has done this whole uh, thing on white privilege. And white privilege, whites are born with, an, with a knapsack, an invisible knapsack, with rights and everything already conferred without even earning. But everybody else has to earn those same privileges. And the other cultural piece was that we still had a culture that we came from. That's still black culture. That's still black culture today. It's just that we were forced to, to assimilate. There's two terms, acculturation and assimilation. And people often use them interchangeably, but they're not. In acculturation, a cultural group uh, keeps their cultural norms and yet navigates through any other culture group or main culture. In assimilation, you are pretty much 
have to be stripped away of what your cultural norms, your cultural values, and what you've all, your worldview, and what you've always known as right and wrong, and what you have believed is no longer so. You have to subscribe now to a whole different being. And so that made a lot of black kids be, I, I'm not using it in the psychological term, but be uh, bipolar. Not in the psych term, but bipolar in that you had to act one way in certain situations and revert. It's just like if you think about people who are bilingual, when they need to speak English, they, they revert right away. If they have to speak Spanish, French, or German, it's, right, it's like unconscious. So it has made uh, many black people have to be uh, act one way here and one way when you're with your family and your friends. And there's even some, excuse for that, because I do cultural diversity training. There's even some who say that there's a triple quandary. One in which everybody has to operate in the mainstream, the courts, the schools, and the, the banks, and all of that. And in the minority experiences, where you have all different minority groups, African Americans, Asians, Hispanic Latinos, and American Indians, and you have these common things that minority groups have to adhere to. And then for African Americans, there's the Afro or Afrocentric experience. That when I'm with my friends, when I'm with my family, at my family reunion, at other things where there's primarily black folks, I have a different kind of being. And I remember Brian saying something too about um, I think he did, either he said it or I read it, because uh, I, I did check out his uh, thesis. Um, he checked it out for me from the, li from the Jordan Library, where he said, or somebody said, that you still have black children congregating together. You still have eight, the Asian children may congregate together. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hopkins can maybe uh, uh, um, can say something about this, but, or the white kids, or the Hispanic kids, everybody has their own little groups. And then there are some multicultural groups. But there's nothing wrong with that, because people feel a comfort and a kinship when they're with people who are like them. Barriers that they don't have to overcome when they're with people like them. I'm gonna start right there. Okay. And my son, both of my sons went to Jordan in the 90s. And, and I don't know how the cafeteria is now, but even when they were going to, um, going to lunch, all the white kids sat together in one side of the cafeteria, and all the black kids sat together in the other side of the cafeteria. But when they walked down the halls and when they interacted, they were all interacting with one another. Um, but they just, they just, and I think it's because of what you said, you just feel more comfortable mm -hmm. eating lunch with people you want to eat lunch with. Um, but in other, you know, athletics or drama or classes, everybody was just the same. And I don't, I, I would like to, I guess that someday I'll go to the cafeteria and see what it's like now. <laughs> 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 Let me say in 73 and, uh, from 73 to 76 that uh, the administration and, and Durham Public Schools actually bent over backwards to uh, make African Americans uh, understand and uh, be able to create some of the curriculum that African Americans were talk, speaking of. Now there was a set in uh, at Jordan High School uh, of course, my mom told me, I called her and I said, is it if sitting in the lobby, I'm going to be in the lobby. And she said, you go ahead and try it if you want to. <laughs> so, I, I, I went to class. <laughs> um, as a result of that setting, and there were several curriculums, I believe, that were established at Jordan High School. Uh, once again, I said that Mr. Seals, James Seals, had the compassion to be able to see these things. 
in the early 70s, from 73 through 76. I can't imagine going through what you had to go through. The way I look at it, and I think the way the 76 class looked at it, I looked at the situation that was behind us, although we were armed with the history, is that we refused to be victims of the past. We wanted to move forward with this thing. So it was nothing to see me at Michael Bryan's house or Lane Willem's house. In Ms. Parker's house, it was nothing for her to feed the whole basketball team. So I'm sitting here thankful for what Janet and Melinda have gone through so we could do what we did. Did I pass it on to my child? Yes, I did, because that's the way I was brought up. Is my child a diverse child? Yes, she is. And I expect her to bring her children up that way, because that's how my parents brought me up. If it had not been for these people, and as I said, the leaders like Frank Hill, Ron Dowdy, um, I probably wouldn't be sitting up here, because Brian probably wouldn't have asked me to sit up here. <laughs> did we have problems? Yes. Were we protected or shielded from those problems? Yes, we were by faculty, by coaches, and by Mr. Seals. But when a problem arise, where African Americans had issues with any curriculum or anything in the school, he listened. He sat down and listened. He didn't turn deaf ear. And he straightened the situation out. I wish he was here today because I wanted this opportunity to tell him how much I appreciate it. You know, as kids, you don't see it. But when you look back and you think about where you've come from and what you are now, then you want to thank the people who were there during the tough times to get you where you are today. And I was, uh, one of the earlier sit-ins, I think Brian noted in the historical outline, was it 69? 76 was no, the only one. of the, uh, the, the uh, homecoming court. Oh, 69, yes, yeah, 69. Yeah, well, my sister Sylvia was the, <laughs> one of the leaders of that one. And, um, and uh, they went to Mr. Seals and said that we have no representation of black students on the homecoming court. I think she ended up being one of the representatives on the court. And I do want to say this, that because I'm a person that believes, you know, as, uh, uh, as, as, as all of our panelists are saying, you know, that, that as you grow, you develop and you experience other things, you, you see things, you see that nothing happens without purpose. And so I'm the person that believes that everything that we go through was for a purpose. And so that, that experience at Jordan High School, even though it was bittersweet, I learned a lot from being there because I eventually went to graduate school at Carolina uh, at the School of Public Health in 1972 uh, when there was also not a lot of, of black students but more. And it, 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 it helped me to be able to navigate that system better because I had been a Jordan. And um, during that time too, we had in my class, I was in uh, public health education, we had about half, we had 20 one uh, students in my class and half were African Americans though, and we had some foreign students as well. And we used to go to each other's houses, we would have potlucks, and we would, have, we would all study together to make sure that we all succeeded. And that was black and white, it was everybody, we went to each other's houses. And I think had I not had that experience at Jordan, I might not have ventured out to maybe something like that, been a part of something like that. And in addition, my son graduated from Jordan in 87, and he was on the football team, again, sports, okay? And for the most part, he didn't have any problems uh, at school. And my daughter graduated in 95, and she was in everything. She was in the, uh, the touring course, the, the Jordan song, whatever they were, whatever. Falcon, 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 song. Falcon song. And she performed in all the performances and went everywhere. I went to the Macy's Parade, went to uh, Russia and all of that. And she just had, and she was 
manager for the boys' football team. She was on the girls' softball team. She was in everything. And I think she had, she went to Giffen's and she went to, uh, to Jordan. She had a great time at Jordan. And she graduated in 95. And my granddaughter graduated in 2011 <laughs> from Jordan. And she, uh, she had a pretty uh, good school time at Jordan, and she was on the yearbook staff. And, um, and she had, you know, she, I think she did, uh, had a pretty good time at Jordan. So yeah. things have changed. I'm not saying that they all are completely lovely, but they have changed. <laughs> Now you've heard the panelists mention Jim Sills' name a couple of times. Jim Sills was our principal. He began at Jordan in 1968. He retired from Jordan in 1991, wow. serving as the principal. And if you if you heard the wows, it's because that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> Nobody stays in a job, certainly that job, as principal of a high school for that long. Uh, he was supposed to be on our panel today. Uh, and he, uh, I heard from him about two hours ago. He's very ill. He could not make the trip to Durham. Uh, but he did send his regrets, and hopefully he will be uh, at Jordan in a couple of weeks. So hopefully if you um, are at the school, you will have the opportunity to see him. Uh, I want to uh, conclude there, uh, because what's great about this opportunity is uh, your opportunity to uh, ask some questions. I don't want you to uh, leave with any burning questions for any of us. But if we could first thank the panel for their participation. Today. I say this with all sincerity, and you'll hear me repeat it at other events that I do. Uh, this book is dedicated to the people on the stage. It's dedicated to the alumni uh, that went through that building. Uh, I'm proud and honored to be a teacher at Jordan High School and have been so since 2001. Uh, getting ready to start my 13th year there. Uh, but I assure you, uh, it's because of the people on this stage and because of the alumni that went through that school, that went through the schools that you attended, um, that we are the school we are uh, today. I have no doubt about it. It's an honor to hear their stories, to write about their stories, and to have them here today. And I can't express my appreciation any more than that. Please. And one more thing. <laughs> that I do have two grandsons that are students at Jordan now. And, you know, I've been to one, one of my grandsons I have custody of, he and his brother. And I've been there many times to talk to Mr. Hopkins over there, who's assistant principal. And I, I, I haven't had an opportunity to talk to Mr. Levitt, but I, I talk to him. Uh -huh, but I always talk, uh -huh, it's, a good, it's a good thing. Oh, I hear his voice every Sunday, but uh, on the school announcements, but Mr. Hopkins I've had more dealings with, and, and the teachers, and Mr. Weaver, there, uh, the a counselor for my grandson, who's had you know, some difficulty because, not because of any of the issues that we talked about, but other difficulties, and they have been very great about handling those issues. My other grandson, on the other hand, is an honors student, and he's in all honors classes, and, and he's doing very well. Um, so I, I would say right now, I, would, I, feel, I feel that my grandchildren are safe at Jordan because of the faculty and the administrators and the staff and the things that are in place at Jordan. I appreciate that. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts from anyone in the room this afternoon? Don't be shy. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I, 
by the, I was class of 81, Maurice was 76, they're both 67. By the time we got to the late 80s, most of the racial stuff was pretty much gone. In fact, in the class of 80, the entire student body was led by Reggie Lyon, who was the first African-American student body president. I ran for student body president the following year against an African-American uh, young man named Franklin Delano Roosevelt Boone. <laughs> now, you put that on the, on the poster after you spent the last four years of social studies learning about Franklin Del Delano Roosevelt, I was at a disadvantage. Um, but the good thing, and I told this to Brian when we were doing the interview, Reggie was absolutely wonderful. He was a great mentor for the school, and you know, we sat with him in the little pre-election meeting, and I could tell he was just as genuine as he, he wanted the best person for the school to win. And he, he did, it was not a black-white thing at all with, with Reggie. I lost, but um, class differences were clearly the major thing. The, the, the old animosities, stemming from the Parkwood Ho Valley Divide uh, were still there, maybe not overtly, but when we get together now, you know, we, we kind of laugh, and I can't believe that was a big issue back then, but the, again, it comes from that issue we were talking about earlier. It, when you talked about the, the knapsack, that knapsack does not necessarily have animosity or animus in it. It has obliviousness in it, right? Yes. It, it's not a function, I don't you understand that when I mention white privilege, it's not that yeah. It's on our face. God, wait, I know that I wake up with these. It, it's unconscious. It's I, I say it's oblivious. I mean, specifically with teenagers, you're the center of the world anyway. You're more concerned about, you know, do I have a pimple? Is my hair? And you just that's the last thing on your mind. But you know, class was the overriding issue. After I think the, the racial stuff had settled down, and then obviously it's still there. You've got haves and have-nots in any group of people you throw together. And when I, when I moved to Jordan in February of 1964, it, it was still the Lowe's Grove Southern kids versus the Hope Valley. And I don't know where Hope Valley kids went to high school um, after they, before, before Jordan. Southern. Southern. And Southern High School. Uh, yeah. But, um, Groton, Andover. <laughs> and you know the, and that was where the divide was. Um, I hate saying things like this, but the Hope Valley girls all had villagers and ladybug clothes and Weegians and papagallos and. I don't and, understand any of the words she's using. Right yeah, now. but it, it's it's it's. If now, someone could explain all that to me later. Yeah, I it, it then becomes the difference between American Eagle and Abercrombie and Fitch. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all caught up. Thanks. <laughs> And that, that is addressed in the book. There, that's one of the more moving things is he addresses that name brand right. stuff. Name and did you re did you remove the thing about the what the woman said why Jordan was put where it was? Uh, remember? Maybe. No, you didn't because I I read it's it. still it's still in the book. Okay. Oh, I, I just oh, hope Valley. Yeah. Why why Jordan is placed where it is? Well, I mean, I, I'll tell you that she alluded to the idea of. Sort of Jordan being there for the wealth and the elites that were in Hope Valley, she referenced Hope Valley as Hopeless Valley, was her explanation. But there was some indication that the school board was populated with Hope Valley residents, right. and that, that I will argue that to the day I right. die. That is there, not that, accurate. To Stephen's point, that did not make the final book, uh, because he's right. But, but I will tell you that the notion exists, and, and perception is reality, the notion exists that that was the the White Hope Valley School. Yeah, and now, you were, you're you were quoting that one administrator. And that right. And, and she's that, wrong. That she she was wrong. wrong. That did not make it into the final book. But but certainly the preconceived notions were there. Now to the question about class and and our focus today is sort of on the integration. Our panel today is on the integration of Jordan High School. But I will tell you that um, class, I would argue, was the driving issue uh, at, at the school from '63 to '68, '69. For, for a significant reason, that there, there weren't that many black students at our school during that time, and the divide was Hope Valley and everywhere else. Race became the shift and the focus from 69 to 76 for some of the reasons we talked about, but class reemerges in 77 as some of the racial tensions subside for reasons you discussed, Maurice. Uh, class reemerges in the late um, 70s and early 80s, and the book ends in, in 88, 25 years into our school's history. But that was the driving issue, uh, I would argue. Uh, and I always get the question, well, what about since then? Well, you know, it's 
hard to answer because I think with the Durham City County merger, it went back to race. You know, since 2000, it's back to class. I mean, it's this, it's, and you could argue maybe it's always been about votes. And I think that argument is legitimate. You know, one drives over the other for a little while and then the other one is back. And unfortunately, both exist. When my son, when my oldest son started Jordan in 1994, and he came, we lived in Lake Park, which is in the Parkwood area, and they went to Lowe's Grove, Parkwood and then Lowe's Grove Middle School. And people that had gone before him said, oh, that there's a real split. There's a split between the kids that went to Hope Valley and Giffen's and the kids that went to Parkwood and Lowe's Grove. And they don't sit together in the cafeteria. And so in the 90s, in 94, it was still there. Again, athletics became the very leveling field. Once you were, you know, really good at football or soccer or what, it didn't matter where you went to elementary school and where you went to middle school. I'm not sure that that's the case anymore. I don't know. It will always be the case. I mean, it's self-perpetuating ignorance. I mean, it can't stop. But I'm not sure how much... It's just, it's like cicadas. I mean, it may go underground for a while, but it's going to reemerge. Other questions? I see a bunch of hands. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think now, even with quite, like, athletics has come up a lot now. Well, now soccer is really popular. Well, some kids play club soccer. Yes. I can tell you that my family has spent many thousands of dollars sending our daughter all over half of the country playing soccer. And so, you know, while athletics can be a unifying factor in some ways, there are very different kids playing soccer than there are playing basketball. You know, that's like, so race and class can play and expand and mix up and do all kinds of things. I was just talking about how athletics may have been a unifying factor at one point and how I don't think that that's possible anymore because of things like club soccer, for example, which creates a different kind of community than what football or basketball might have done. Other questions, other comments? And I will certainly repeat the questions, and I apologize for that. Yes, sir. Well, did I miss this? But what exactly happened at the... That's a great question, and I appreciate you asking that. No, you didn't miss it because I didn't tell you. That's a great question. And why? I will tell you that it began back in 72. In 1972, we had... Our cheerleaders went up to a game at Enloe High School. Enloe then was all black. Jordan was mostly white. And our cheerleaders were attacked after that game in 1972. In 1973, there were a number of demonstrations, two demonstrations that I write about in the school challenging some race relations. We had an organization called the African Dance Group, eventually the Creative Dance Group, who wanted to do a show and I think Maurice mentioned or alluded to this, wanted to do a show, and they were told that they were not allowed to do that. Now, a lot of debate about this show, you know, nobody's going to get away with, you can ask my principal who I saw walk into the room, nobody's going to get away with sort of asking for a two-hour show in the middle of the day. It's not going to be approved. But again, the high school perception was, well, the African Dance Group, their show's not allowed, there were issues over that. They went to Mr. Sills, they asked, they talked, they compromised. There was a show that night. The white students in protest checked out of school early. Uh, it was born from this show and these challenges. That show did happen. Um, the, they created a new class on our campus, 1974, called Black Humanities. Elnora Shields. Elnora Shields taught Black Humanities. Um, some people were happy with that, some people were not. Uh, an organization, black student organization, came out of that called OSEBA, the Organization of Students Interested in Black Affairs. And so there were still some underlying tensions from all of these issues, and both black and white students decided that they wanted to sort of challenge some of these issues. And so in January of 1975, or December 1975, uh, they had a sit-in, about 50 students uh, sat in the front lobby. Now Maurice, Maurice wasn't there, his parents would have killed him. But, uh, <laughs> But students, about 50 of them, sat in, refused to go to class, made, it, made a bunch of ruckus. 
and Mr. Sales came out and talked to the students and said, listen, I appreciate what you're doing here. I appreciate the frustrations that you feel that you're having, but, but we, can't, we can't do it this way. So I need everybody to go back to class and I will meet with uh, about six of you, six student leaders, and we'll talk about, let's talk about these issues. What uh, uh, well, all these, the story, the events that I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, you know, these racial issues that sort of defined our school's history during that time that everybody didn't feel that they were included into the, into school. Well, the demands, well, I mean, the demands weren't necessarily, I mean, the student frustration was that they wanted more involvement. They wanted more opportunity. You saw it back in 1969 when there were no blacks on the homecoming court, but they want uh, black students at our school and, and, and white supporters wanted more opportunity for performance, wanted a class, wanted student organizations, and a lot of that during Mr. Sills' tenure uh, happened. It happened. And so when we, when I say that they were sort of protesting racial issues, that those were what they wanted. Those were the issues they were challenging and, and the, the demands, though I don't know that they would describe it that way, I would certainly today, those were the things that they wanted. Inclusiveness right. is right. what they were looking for. We've got time for maybe two more questions. Um, you mentioned the idea of obliviousness. You know, we just, as white privilege, we just don't recognize it. So what do you think perhaps the kids that are in Jordan today are missing um, in terms of white privilege? Um, a way I've heard it referred to is, you know, a fish is in water. He doesn't, he doesn't realize that he's in water. And that's sort of what can happen. You know, I can, I'm just swimming along, not even realizing all of this, like you've said, Mr. Berenger. So what kinds of things do you think the kids today are missing? Repeat the question. This is probably one of the best poems I've been to because there's a, actually dialogue going on about racism. That's what's going to help all kids, both black and white. And the reason I say that is because I had this discussion for 30 years on the streets of Durham. I've seen white kids that could have been saved that weren't saved. I've scraped black kids off the ground that could have been saved. If we include our kids in discussion about race, economic, uh, social, it's going to help. This is something that touches my soul, so I might get carried away with it, but we got to have inclusiveness. Mr. Griffin, I just I seen this for a long can time. I just add, and, and I'll have you be the final question, sir, and I this promise, else, so uh, or a couple wow. questions as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you that um, the cynical response to that question is we're not there yet, mm -hmm. because we're not having those conversations. Mm -hmm. They don't happen. Uh, I've been a school teacher for 13 years. They don't happen. Uh, certainly not in the day-to-day. -day, um, exchanges. And some of them for legitimate reasons, others for not. Uh, I, I teach a class on campus today called Minority Studies. And I will tell you the Minority Studies class that I teach is one of the places where those conversations happen. Mm -hmm. Stuart Albright teaches a creative writing class. That's where those conversations happen. It's in the electives where students want to sign up for them and take them. And we take time to have those conversations. The Minority Studies class on campus, by the way, I will tell you, started as Black Humanities in 1974. Started at that. That got changed, the title got changed, the message stays the same, I hope. I also teach a class called Poverty in America where we talk about class issues. But day to day, on average, those conversations are not happening. Two more comments, we'll go here and then ma'am over there and then we'll have to end, but we will stick around. Uh, but if I don't wrap up by 4.30, um, Lynn says, gives, continues to give me dirty looks. So, I just want yes, to say and had us and during PE class put up sleepers. So we built the football stadium. Arthur, after we would have football practice, we'd start walking down Hope Valley Road. And I'm one of nine kids, and I was able to get a car, and I would pick Arthur up. Arthur, would you like a ride home? Well, you can't go in my neighborhood. I said, why not? He said, I'll be picked up. And he lived where Fayetteville and Fort Wallace are the same name, where right behind White Rock Baptist, right. back in there, and I would have to drop him off. But I carried him every day when we had those two-a-day practices. And, you know, I, I made a point to try to get to know him. 
and David too. You'll fall in those. <laughs> he threw his leg. He knocked my head off. <laughs> but I was there with him and Henderson. But as a kid, I grew up on Trinity Avenue, first, second, third, moved out to the Hope Valley area, fourth through eighth. And then I had to go to Southern. The last year was over. Okay? We, of course, were all white. I played on an all-white basketball team, slow as I was, short as I was. And we went to Henderson. Okay, we were all white school. They threw stuff on our bus. They picked on us. That's just what they did in Henderson. The ball field was near the field. All right, the next year when David and I went up there, I saw the same thing. And they, that's just what they did. But I just want to say, what you're doing here today is wonderful. I think it needs to be done. That's my my. Two of my kids graduated from Georgia, and they don't understand, they can't understand how, how could it have been that you didn't have any of these black kids? They can't understand. So, you know, I, I admire you for what you do. Lynn, I promise one final that's, that's question. Fine. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, brother. What's your financial status was as children or as a family, and were you low? The question you may have heard, but the question of the African American panelists, their class when they were a student at Jordan, and what impact that played. And the academics too. Are you talking about social class or? Yeah. Well, early in my in, in my life, I was dirt poor. There's no doubt about that. Beans and weenies and so forth. Uh, both parents worked work two and three jobs to uh, get us in and out from around the uh, public housing, if you will. Um, and they did it, not the best house in the world. Um, the average family that struggled to put clothes on our back. I wasn't any different than any, any, uh, some of the kids that are in school today. Like I said, parents talked to me. And that communications, just as you, just as you said, that I was just as good as anyone else. And that's where my work ethic comes from. That's where, where, where my siblings' work ethic comes from. Um, I wish we did have money. I would have loved to put on some Tommy Hilfiger and stuff like that. But uh, uh, I really didn't have an issue, a social issue. Because, I mean, I was always a communicator. And I just believe that's, that's the way we get by these things, is communication. Was I angry because I didn't have those things? No, I wasn't. But I did say this to myself. I promised myself that it would be better for my child. And it is. And when she makes it better for her child, or children, I hope, then we, you know, we eliminate a lot of this by generation, through attrition. It's how we get rid of things. We get rid of the old way of thinking. You know, I may not be able to see it, but I know it's going to happen. Because it has over the past. Look how far Jordan High School has come. In my case, um, as I said, there were seven children. And um, we didn't get running water until I was 13. We lived what we call out in the country. And um, I tell my students this today, they can't believe it. We had one, we had fried chicken, we had one chicken for nine people. And, um, but anyways, um, <laughs> We, I, I guess we were considered uh, low income, low to moderate income. Both my parents worked, and as uh, he said, both my parents worked two jobs and uh, to try to make sure that we had. And the other thing was that my mother and my grandmother were such great seamstresses that a lot of the clothes that Janet was talking about, they could make. I told them what it looked like. And they made them. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I want to thank all of you for coming today. Let's give this great <laughs>
uh, I guess you'd call it the grand finale for that um, year of commemoration, is going to take place at the Durham Performing Arts Center Saturday, October 5th, um, 12 to 5? I thought it was a short... Anyway, it's go online. <laughs> um, and the tickets are just $5. I think it's going to be a really interesting commemoration, and I hope you guys will come. One other thing, if you pick up an evaluation and fill it out, it helps us make the programming even better for you. They're back on the back table. So if you feel like doing that, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming.